here we go. And I welcome you to a special NFL version of the Skip Bayless Show dropping here on a Monday. By the way, though, I will get to one NBA topic. I'll get to LeBron cursing out Rui Hachimura on the bench. I'll get to that in just a few minutes. But first up, one of the greatest days of NFL buzzer beaters I can ever remember, starting with, of course, Hail Jaden. I don't think I've ever been more shocked by a game-ending play in my life than what I witnessed in Washington yesterday. I, I mean, this for me was even beyond what Freddie Freeman did, walk off grand slam, two outs, bases low to bottom of the 10th. Freddie Freeman was certainly capable of hitting a home run in that circumstance, so I wasn't just shock shocked about what I saw. And for that matter, just a quick historical note, I did watch the original Hail Mary. Roger Staubach to Drew Pearson. I watched it from my couch on television. It was January 28th of 1975. It was a long time ago. But here's the difference. Obviously, I'm a lifelong diehard Cowboy fan. Roger Staubach was already a proven miracle maker at that point. My Cowboys were up in Minnesota in the outdoor cold. Roger was going against the wind in a playoff game. But I I just watched him convert. Are you ready for this? Fourth and 17 from deep in his own territory against that wind with a pinpoint sideline pass to the greatest clutch receiver I ever saw, a man named Drew Pearson, undrafted out of Tulsa of all places. Now, I later got to know Roger. I got to know Drew very well as I covered the Cowboys, and I wrote in stunning detail about all the miracles that they made together. That was in my first Cowboys book, God's Coach. Yet, even as I watched that Minnesota playoff game from my couch, I'd already come to believe so deeply in Roger Staubach, Heisman winner out of Navy, that it did not shock me when he pulled off what he pulled off. So just to get you back in time. This was from the 50 yard line on the game's final play. Cowboys down 14 to 10 first round of the playoffs. Right. Roger gives it this big exaggerated pump fake to his left. Then he comes back right to drew Pearson and Roger had to throw it more on a line to cut through the wind. And afterward, Roger ever the good Catholic boy told the media, I closed my eyes and said a hail Mary. And that nickname stuck. Every last second heave thereafter became a Hail Mary or a Hail Somebody, forgive us, Mary. But in Roger's case, that wind-cheating bullet that he fired fell just a little short against the wind to Drew Pearson. It's around the five-yard line. Drew had to fight back for the football, and there was contact with the cornerback, Nate Wright, who did fall down. No flag was thrown because Drew found the ball before Wright did and was merely going back for the ball. Contact incidental. But the catch was transcendental. Drew Pearson somehow momentarily pinned the ball, I I think between his elbow and his thigh, before he secured it and proceeded right on into the end zone. Cowboys 17-14 launching them towards Super Bowl X, which was the first Super Bowl I would cover. Super Bowl X, that was against Pittsburgh and Miami. So as a Cowboy fan, I I was obviously electrified by that throw and by that catch, but but I wasn't shocked. I mean, it was Roger, the greatest, most magical Cowboy quarterback ever. I also watched the Hale Flutie for my couch. That was November 23rd, 1984. But again, Flutie was a leprechaun playing quarterback. He could make pass rushers and cornerbacks just disappear. I don't know how he did it, but he did it. Flutie was on his way to winning the Heisman at BC, Boston College. In that game, he'd already thrown for 400-plus yards against Jimmy Johnson's University of Miami 
And on the last play of that game, the Hurricanes underestimated the little man's arm, and he cut loose a 63-yard pass that in this case carried completely over all the Miami DBs gathered at the goal line, just completely flew them and fell right into the waiting hands of Gerard Phelan all alone in the end zone, Boston College 47, Miami 45. No tip drill involved at all on either the Roger Staubach play or the Doug Flutie play. Again, electrifying, but to me not shocking. Now back to yesterday. Yes, Jaden Daniels also won the Heisman, obviously at LSU. But I was surprised Jaden Daniels even played in the game. He had battered ribs. I I don't know if they're cracked, bruised, sore. They were just sore. I was impressed. He sucked it up and he gutted it out, which he probably did because the opponent, of course, was the rookie quarterback taken first overall, one slot above him. And Jaden wanted to say, watch this. And Jaden had made some very good throws against Caleb Williams and the Bears. But until that last drive, think about this. He was only 18 of 35, barely over 50% after he had led the NFL by far all season in completion percentage going into this game. So Jaden clearly was not himself. If you've ever had bruised or cracked ribs, trying to throw a football, if you're trying to throw it hard, will bring tears to your eyes as you twist your torso to try to create some velocity. Jaden clearly did not have his usual miles per hour, did not have his usual accuracy, and clearly the slightest bit of contact on any kind of scramble or designed run for him was no fun. You saw him wince. You saw him smile away the pain several times. So a healthy Jaden would have turned, let's say, three of those four field goals that they had to take into touchdowns. This game should have been, would have been way over by the fourth quarter if he had been healthy. And for the record, when healthy, Jaden's already displayed that he was born with the clutch gene. We, we saw that on that Monday night in Cincinnati against Joe Burrow and the Bengals. So it, it wasn't that I was doubting his intangibles at the end of this game, but I definitely was skeptical of his ability to throw the football the way he was born to throw it on the final play of the game. Also, by the way, <clears throat> what I've always loved the most about Caleb Williams are his intangibles, his competitive fire, his football backbone. I'd seen this movie before when Caleb was at Oklahoma, at USC. He struggles for three quarters without getting a bit discouraged because he just keeps escaping, running, and flinging until he finally catches fire, as he finally did yesterday. And suddenly you looked up. And the same Bears who had done a whole lot of nothing in that football game were, what? They were had 15 to 12? It was impossible. The Bears were about to steal one at Washington. So after that late kickoff, Jaden Daniels had the football first and 10 at his 24 with 19 seconds left in his first pass was not a thing of beauty his first pass was a nose diving dirt ball that Zach Ertz one hopped incomplete and I'm thinking oh this is going to end ugly 12 seconds left Jaden goes back to Ertz over the middle for 11 yards not bad not a lot of velocity they gave it to him okay first and 10 at the Washington 35 six seconds left So Tony Romo on CBS called for a short completion and Jason Garrett on NBC later blasted the Bears for allowing a short completion. But I got to tell you, I'm watching in real time, obviously. Six ticks left, no timeouts. I I thought you were at high risk of ending the game with a short completion. If it's at all off target, maybe it's caught in bounds. 
I do not blame the Bears coaches for allowing it. I mean, Jaden Daniels obviously was laboring to throw it at all. So just give him that, force him into the Hail Mary, because the last thing you wanted to give Jaden Daniels at that point, six seconds left, was to cheat up and gamble and watch him manage to throw one just over your head for a breakaway long completion, maybe a touchdown, maybe sort of the anti-Hail Mary. Will you run it in? Now, any of that kind of criticism for the short completion, it's just an easy 2020 hindsight. The Bears played it correctly, conservatively. And as you know, Jaden hit McLaurin right on the sideline, 13 yards out of bounds. Time for one last gasp from the Washington 48. So Tony Romo said up in the booth that at that point he would consider putting Marcus Mariota in. And I, I got to tell you, I tweeted this. I was with Tony on this. The most painful maneuver. Jaden Daniels could make at that point would be trying to wind up and throw a football as far and as hard as he possibly could. I, I cringe just thinking about it. Now, now sure, Mariota, he's got a pretty strong arm. This is not Jaden's arm, but it's pretty strong. Why not? I'm with Tony. Let Mariota heave the last pass. Yet, yeah. what did Jaden Daniels do? When he caught the snap, he began to retreat a whole lot. I'm saying, no, Jaden, no, 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 no. You're making this impossibly hard on yourself. Jaden goes back, back, back. Then he loops way wide to his right. Then he evaded a couple of rushers, and he looped way back to his left toward the pocket. In, in all my years of watching Hail Mary's, no one has ever created as much time to throw the Hail Mary as Jaden did on this play. It was 13 total seconds. I defy you to go back and find somebody who created more than 13 seconds of time before they even heaved the hail. 13 seconds? He's running around and he's running around, but he's getting deeper and deeper and deeper. And I'm saying, Jaden... You, you're, you're making it impossibly hard on yourself. And by the way, you're, you're giving the defense time on the other end to set up and box out your receivers. You need time for your receivers to get down there, but they had more than enough time to go, go all the way to the goal line and stand and wait for you to heave. And then Jaden Daniels did something that shocked me almost out of my chair. He pulled up 15 yards behind the line of scrimmage. And Jaden Daniels whipped a 65-yard rainbow. I did not think he was capable of throwing at that point. It had height. It had distance. It, it was a miraculous achievement just to throw the football that fire, that far fire it that far with, with ribs that I assume were screaming back. Okay, now to the development. I did not obviously see in real time. None of us saw it in real time. Not until later did I see and absorb the cell video of Tyreek Stevenson taunting, pointing at Commander's fans while you can see the commander receivers running toward the end zone, Tyreek Stevenson, my God, Tyreek Stevenson has his back to the play. He's, he's pointing at, at fans in the stands while you can see the stealths coming behind him. Enemy receivers are bearing down on your goal line, young man. They're right behind you. I have never seen anything like this in my life. Then you can see Stevenson have his old bleep moment. Look over his shoulder. Oh, oh, maybe I better get back in the play. 
And at first he sets up like he's playing zone on the left side of the goal line for just a moment. And then all of a sudden the ball's in the air, but it took 13 seconds to throw it. And, and all of a sudden Tyreek Stevenson is now running toward the scrum that's developing the jump ball at the goal line. And he did arrive just in time to leap sideways into the scrum in, in real time, it looked like the Stevenson, he's six feet tall, looked like Stevenson got a little piece of the football. I think he did. I think he got his fingertips on it. Though, for sure, six foot five inch Zach Ertz got a bigger piece of the football and managed to do exactly what he had practiced and practiced and practiced doing, which is tipping it backward into the end zone. And by the way, another quick point here is it, if I'm seeing this correctly, it, it's happening so fast as I watch the tape, it, it looks like that four Bears defensive backs descend upon six foot five inch Zach Ertz, who's leaping at the goal line and, and out jumping all four of them. So it looks like there's another Bears receiver short of the scrum. Only Ertz is in the middle of the scrum. And obviously, there's this guy, this ex-cowboy named, named Noah Brown, and, and he somehow has separated from the pack, although I'm pretty sure that's the way they practice it. And he is standing all by his lonesome as the ball falls softly right into his hands for the game-winning and game-ending touchdown. So, obviously, the idea is to get bodies in front of the receivers, to box them out from the football, and to knock it down. Knock it out. It's pretty simple. You knock it down. Some teams have one corner assigned to guard the end zone behind the jump ball scrum, if it's at the goal line just in case of that backward tip. I am not sure what, and, and Eberflus, the Bears coach, did not say what Stevenson's responsibility on that play was. It's possible he was supposed to be that guy, and he kind of lost his mind as he's going back and forth with the fans and forgot what his assignment was on the play. So, that brings me to this. Even though Stevenson apologized on social media, even though he was a second-round pick, he did lead the team in pass breakups as a rookie. He did help them win their opener with a late pick six that basically won the football game. Beyond all that, today I would go Jimmy Johnson and I would cut Tyreek Stevenson just to send a message to the team. That will not be tolerated. But, of course, the problem here is that Matt Eberflus is already on enough of a hot seat in and of himself that he doesn't remotely have Jimmy Johnson in Dallas like job security. So I'm assuming he would consider it cutting off nose to spite face to actually cut Stevenson. Even though Stevenson can struggle, he can be a flaky, weak link in the defense. He's had his ups and many, many downs. But he's also very, very talented. I'm sorry, I would not stand for that kind of behavior as my team lost a game that way. I'm, I'm certainly not saying it was all Stevenson's fault, but that kind of childish, game-over, front-running behavior just cannot be tolerated if you truly want to build a winning football culture. <laughs> At least I would suspend Stevenson for a game, even though you'd have to battle with the NFLPA, and I'd say... I'm going to go to battle. There just has to be some kind of punishment beyond just public embarrassment for Tyreek Stevenson. I wasn't even aware of who he was as the opposite corner for Chicago until yesterday, but now I will never forget him as he became the ugly underbelly to one of the most sensational plays in NFL history. It may go down as the most sensational play, even though it wasn't of playoff magnitude. So, as Jaden Daniels' pass did descend toward the goal line, I was watching with my daughter Hazel, our little Maltese. She mostly sleeps through 
the many, many, many NFL games I try to absorb. But Tony Romo was raising such a ruckus that Hazel was awake at this point. And when Jaden's rainbow wound up in Noah's hand, see what I did there? Biblical divine intervention, rainbow and Noah. When Noah caught it in the end zone, I leaped out of my chair and I did a dance. And I'm not even a commander fan. I I don't even really care about the commanders. I like Jaden, but I certainly don't like anything Washington as a Cowboy fan. And Hazel leaped right out of her bed and started barking at me because she knew this was all time. It it just seemed like Jaden Daniels reaching down into his soul and willing away his bruised or sore ribs that nearly kept him from playing and heaving a football that far and one of his receivers actually winding up with said football it just seemed like that was 10 trillion to one at that moment. And a moment later, there on television was a shockingly calm Jaden Daniels taking zero credit for what he had just wrought. He just shrugged and said, It was from God. Thank you, young man. That's when I knew this kid is really, really special. You want to talk about humility? You want to talk about maturity? You want to talk about in-the-moment perspective that's far, far beyond his years? You want to talk about special? Something very, very special is going on in Washington. Something meant to be special. Whew! Time out for a little breakfast of champions, a little nectar of the gods. Ah, Diet Mountain Dew. Okay, so the commanders are now six and two. Which brings me to my Dallas Cowboys, who obviously played last night, Sunday night. I tried to give them one last hurrah. I tried to be a good Cowboy fan, even though, as you know, I don't believe in this team. I went ahead and picked this team. I pounded the table for this team to go win a game that felt to me like a must-win game. I said they're going to beat the San Francisco 49ers in Santa Clara this time. Cowboys coming off a bye. Cowboys have obviously played much better on the road than at home. And the 49ers were reeling coming off their loss in the Super Bowl rematch to Kansas City. They don't have Christian McCaffrey, and they lost Ayuk for the rest of the year. And Brock Purdy was coming off the worst game of his professional career And I thought he would struggle in this game, and did he ever for a while? And was I ever all over him on Twitter X for a while? Was I all over him on social media for a while? But I needed my team to win just to stay relevant because I'm looking down the road at at Atlanta this coming Sunday, Philly at home, I'll get to them in a second, Houston at home, and then guess what? At Jaden Daniels at Washington. I I, I don't like their chances in that game either. So my Cowboys came out. I inspired them. They came out and played their best first half of this football season, which has been pretty bad, so that wasn't all that great. But they did. They played their best first half. They held Brock Purdy and company, even without weapons, to six total points in the first half. They led 10 to 6 at halftime, and it should have been worse. It easily could have been 17 to 6 at halftime, but it wasn't. It was just 10. And I'm assuming that everybody just sat around and ate ham sandwiches, or maybe they celebrated halftime. We did that. It's over. We're good. We showed everybody we can actually play a decent half of football at San Francisco. And they did. 
I don't know what Mike McCarthy was doing. He probably doesn't do anything at halftime because he is the single worst pregame, halftime motivator I have ever closely observed. I, I guess he and they just decided, we good, that's enough. And they came out and, and stunk in the third quarter even worse than they have stunk at home in four straight games at Jerry World. They got blown off the field in the third quarter, 21 to nothing. San Francisco had 167 total yards in the third quarter alone to a grand total of 16 for Dak Prescott and company. 167 yards to 16 in the third quarter alone. And then, as I always predict, as I always say, Dak Prescott, master of the fourth quarter garbage yards, here he came, giving us all a little bit of false hope a little bit of fraudulent maybe. And they fought back, and they blew a coverage and let CeeDee Lamb completely loose in the end zone for a touchdown. Then two 49ers ran into each other and let CeeDee Lamb completely loose on a touchdown pass. And all of a sudden, it got all the way back to 30 to 24. And Dak did throw one very good late ball that would have extended the game. I don't think they would have won, but it would have extended the game. A deep ball to Turpin, once the USFL MVP as a receiver, but mostly as a returner. And this kid's been a bust at receiver because, weirdly, he can catch punts and kickoffs that he faces up that come down into his breadbasket with nobody around him. He can do that just fine. But on downfield throws that go over his shoulder, he can't find and track them. He basically can't catch. He didn't really come close to catching this ball over his shoulder along the deep sideline. 30 to 24 stood. Dak missed his last four passes, though that one should have been caught. And the Dallas Cowboys have fallen to eight and I'm sorry, into four and four as they approach my prediction of eight and nine. And I say approach because I, I'm not sure they can get to eight and nine now. I, I think I wildly overestimated them at miss the playoffs eight and nine. They're four and four. I'm sorry, three and four. I'll get this right. They're three and four. And I predicted eight and nine. And I'm looking down the schedule and even. I gave you the schedule up to Thanksgiving. They do get the Giants at home on Thanksgiving. You would think they could win that. They still get to play Carolina. You would think they could win that. But I didn't mention that they have to go to Philadelphia, and then they have to play Washington, obviously, again. Still have to play Joe Burrow. Still have to play Baker Mayfield and the Bucks for what that's worth. I'll get to him in just a moment. But where is this team going when it can't run the football a lick. I I mean, I'm looking at these numbers, and I was hard on Brock Purdy, though I love Brock Purdy. And I always say he had two of the most sensational first two years this side of Tom Brady as Mr. Irrelevant. I mean, how did Brock Purdy snap out of his slump in the third quarter? He started running the football, escaping, gashing the Dallas Cowboy defense, In fact, he wound up with 56 yards rushing for the game. My team in total had 56 rush yards. 56 rush yards. I first guessed this. I said, we will have the worst running back room in pro football. And I didn't even know we were going to go get Dalvin Cook. They resurrected him up off the practice squad for last night. He carried six times for a grand total of 12 yards. Zeke, I'll say it again, my nose runs faster than Zeke at this point in his career. He's, as LeBron would say, washed. He's done. He's shot. Blast from past that is way past its prime. Look what Zeke did. He had one great run last night. It was the best run, as I tweeted, that he's had in two years. It was for 11 yards. He had a a grand total 
of 34 yards. So if you subtract the 11, he wound up with 9 for 23. That's 2.6 a try. That's pathetic. My team as a whole averaged 2.9 yards per try. That's impossible to win with. I'm sorry. I, I'm watching the man that Jerry Jones made the highest paid player in the history of pro football, Dak Prescott. And now I've seen him play four straight games and four straight losses against San Francisco, and he's averaged two interceptions a game for four. That's eight total interceptions. And he can't run anymore. He's completely immobile. He's statuesque. Even when he's dared to run, even when the defense breaks down and he has an opening to run, he used to be a running quarterback. I used to love him. I used to campaign for him in the old days on first take when he was at Mississippi State in his junior year when they rose to number one. He was a flat-out running quarterback, a dual threat. I don't know what's happened to him, but Jerry gave him all that money, the most money ever, at a stage and age in which he can't run an inch. So Brock Purdy ran his way out of his slump, and we took a, a shot to the jaw in the third quarter, 21 to nothing because of Brock Purdy, and Dak can't run a lick? Are you kidding me? We can't run, and now we can't hide. We have nowhere to hide. We are rotten to the core. We are devoid of leadership at head coach and at quarterback. And there are times I watch Dak's body language, and it just seems so unurgent to me. It seems so without fire to me. It seems actually to border on without desire to me. I, I asked myself last night, especially in the third quarter, does Dak really care? He's got it down to a science where when the game's completely out of hand and you're down 27 to 10 and it's over, then you go master of fourth quarter garbage yards and you pad your stats and everybody can say, look, Dak's thrown for X yards and this and that. He hasn't done it this year because, what is he, 10 touchdowns to eight interceptions this year? 22nd in QBR this year? It, it's it's just hard to watch. It just tears me apart because I first guessed all of it. They are dead men walking because their quarterback is the opposite of a leader, of a fire starter. He's a fire dowser with his body language. And, and he's the highest paid in all of pro football. And Chris Collinsworth tore me apart at the end of the broadcast last night by saying, Defending Dak. Well, they had no choice. They had to. They they had every choice in the world. Look what San Francisco did. Jimmy G was their quarterback and got them all the way not only to the Super Bowl but into the fourth quarter of that Super Bowl, the first one that Mahomes played, all the way into the fourth quarter. I don't know, eight nine minutes left in the game. They're up twenty to ten with Jimmy G at quarterback. And because he fell apart in the fourth quarter, Kyle Shanahan, John Lynch just said, that's enough. We want to actually get to and win a Super Bowl. And they decided they couldn't do it with Jimmy G. So they gave three first round picks to trade up for Trey Lance. And then they felt like they had swung and missed at Trey Lance. But that was easy to conclude because Brock Purdy fell out of the sky into their laps with the last pick in the next draft, obviously. And here they went with Brock Purdy, and that was the correct decision. I, I know I was so hard on Brock Purdy last week, but you can ask my producer Tyler Korn about this. We actually had a question that we were going to hold, a question from last week about can we trade Dak? Well, obviously, he's got a no-trade clause now, and I came up with one fantasy trade in the bottom of my soul, the, the back end of my psyche, and I thought, is it possible that at some point, if Brock Purdy continues to struggle, that Kyle and John Lynch would, would say, I don't know, maybe, maybe we swung and missed here. 
Would it be possible they would take a 30-year-old DAC, and what's he into now, his ninth year? Would they take him and say, well, Dallas has screwed him up. He's way better than he's been able to play in Dallas because it is just such a mess there. It's such a comedy of errors. It's so dysfunctional. Is it possible that they would take Dak in exchange for Brock Purdy? Because I would take Brock Purdy in a heartbeat over Dak Prescott. Is it possible that Dak would say, sure, I will okay a trade to San Francisco just to change scenery, start over, start fresh with a winning organization? Please, God, give us Brock Purdy. Other than that, we're just dead men walking through the rest of a schedule that's only going to get worse and worse. Okay, so yesterday, as I stood back, end of day, the most impressive team, NFC for sure. I, I think I can say the most impressive team I saw all day. I have to be honest, Cowboy fans. It, it was the Philadelphia Eagles crushing the Bengals at Cincinnati. And yes, I've hated the Bengals since I was five years old. And yes, before the season, I picked the Eagles to win the Super Bowl in part because they got so much better through free agency in the draft and because the Cowboys did next to nothing. Ah. Uh, in case you miss this, do you realize if Saquon hadn't dropped that little pass at Atlanta that would have ended the game? All it's just a little pop pass from Jalen Hurts. If he catches it, secures it, completes the first down, the game is over and the Eagles would be 6 and 1. But they are 5 and 2. After they spotted the Bengals a 7 to nothing lead at Cincinnati, then they flat out dominated 37 to 17. They drafted the two best cornerbacks in the draft, Quinion Mitchell, Cooper DeGene. And yeah, I know the Bengals have struggled at home. They've lost three straight. But Joe Burrow hasn't struggled at all. He leads the NFL in QBR. And I tweeted this yesterday and I stand by it. He is still the best thrower of the football in all of football. He's difficult to beat in Cincinnati, even though his team is falling apart all around him. He didn't have T. Higgins yesterday, but he is still Halloween scary to have to defend. And yeah, the Eagles are down still a couple starters in their offensive line. But let me tell you this, as long as they have their quarterback, as long as they have Jalen Hurts, who is now sixth in QBR, they good. Jalen Hurts plays with a tenacity, a quiet fire, a purpose I never sense from Dak Prescott. So while the Commanders are the magic carpet team in this division, while the Commanders seem to be the team of destiny this year, the out-of-nowhere team in the NFL, do not sleep on the Eagles. Now, you might remember I also picked the Ravens to win the AFC and play the Eagles in the Super Bowl. I got to tell you, I was so disappointed in the Baltimore Ravens yesterday. Something is missing. I, I don't know. Championship teams win the game that they ended up losing yesterday at Cleveland. Something is missing here. I don't know if it's in John Harbaugh. I don't know if it's in Lamar's leadership, but neither the coach nor the quarterback were able to have their team ready enough to play against a team that still has a very good defense, a team that finally had been able to replace Deshaun Watson with Jameis Winston. Jameis is such a good guy, so much fun to be around as in easy to root for, easy to play with, to play for. It, it, it went from night to day with Jameis at quarterback because that team clearly was having fun just playing with and for Jameis 
after the nightmare it had suffered through with the Deshaun, who is just a shell of himself. He is shattered psychologically and sometimes I think completely physically. He's just shot. He's washed in different ways. He's washed psychologically from all that he went through in Houston and segueing into Cleveland, and it still goes on. But still, no matter how much new life Jameis brought to the Browns, the Ravens had chance after chance after chance to put that game away, a game you just have to win if you're talking about being a championship team, if you're talking about having another AFC championship game at home. You just have to figure that one out. So with a minute and eight seconds left, Baltimore's up one. Lamar had pulled off a nice late drive to give him a one-point lead. Jameis has moved the ball down to the Baltimore 38. Jameis finally did what Jameis has done so often. The reason Tom Brady replaced him at Tampa was because they had gone seven and nine because he had led the NFL in turnovers. Jameis did what Jameis always does. He airmailed his receiver a throw that hit Kyle Hamilton right in the hands. And Kyle Hamilton, of all Ravens, dropped the game. He's such a great kid. He's a potentially great player. Obviously, he was picked 14th overall out of Notre Dame. And that was in 2022. Made first team all pro in 23. We're talking six feet, four inches, 220 pounds, excuse me, 225 pounds. Great range, great intangibles. You just have to catch that. Ed Reed catches that, obviously, and Ed Reed is still running with that. And poor Kyle Hamilton, of all great kids, dropped the game. There's just something missing in the Ravens that Halloween scares me for my pick of the Ravens. Okay, I wasn't one who said, no, 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 Tua, no, you must retire. That's it. It's over. You've got to go. I didn't say that at all. You didn't hear a peep out of me. All I said is, if Tua has all the information from all the best doctors and the NFL clears Tua to play, and knowing all the risks, if he wants to go ahead and risk, fine by me. It's life. If that makes you happy, Tua... If it makes you happy to play football and and risk God knows what, especially with head injuries, I'm happy if you're happy. But here's been my point about Tua from moment one. I just don't think he's good enough to be a franchise quarterback. I, I said it before his draft. He just doesn't have a big enough arm I don't think his body was meant to play long-term pro football. He's just too fragile, too brittle. It's just not meant to be. Brian Flores was right about Tua. I know Tua fired back at Brian Flores. Brian Flores had to swallow some pride, take the hit, as the defensive coordinator now up in Minnesota. But I was on record before the draft, the Tua draft, He reportedly had five surgeries while he was in college at Alabama. He's a soft armor with a fragile body. He's a great kid. Another one easy to root for. Got a big standing O yesterday in Miami for getting down and sliding. Way to go. Way to go. Mike McDaniel has worked wonders with Tua. But his ceiling is just low. I'm just being honest about this. This is also life. He played okay yesterday in his return against Arizona. Had a QBR of 49 and scale 0 to 100, so it's just a tick below average. Tyreek must have been a little happier. He caught six balls for 72 yards, but they lost at the buzzer. As Kyler threw for 307, Kyler 
at a QBR of 89. That was 40 points higher than Tua. Two is just not the long-term answer in Miami. And now from here on, everybody who cares about the Dolphins, who loves this young man, Tua, everybody is going to have to hold their breath when a defender even lays a finger on Tua. So I'm sorry, but I'm just not surprised the team quarterbacked by Aaron Rodgers has fallen all the way to two and six. I said the Jets wouldn't even make the playoffs after a number of people picked them to either be in or win the Super Bowl. But we know what happened. The all-time blame deflecting finger pointer Aaron Bleepin Rodgers quietly told his owner it's the coach's fault. And he quietly told the front office, I just need my soulmate receiver back. I need Devontae. Done and done. And now the Jets are done and done. Because Aaron Rodgers, right before your very eyes, is close to being done. Aaron Rodgers has now fallen to 23rd in QBR. He's not even average. He has lost a shocking amount of arm strength, has a hard time throwing the ball downfield now. And I saw a quote from one of the New England players after the game. He just can't move anymore. He just can't. He doesn't move the way he used to, obviously, towards Achilles last year. He's going on 41 years of age. I don't think he ever took care of himself the way Tom Brady did. I think most of his fire has gone out while Brady's raged all the way to the bitter end at age 45. Aaron Rodgers is more interested now in making 50 more million dollars and just being a celebrity in New York City. Joke is on the Jets for buying into his fraudulent reputation and his fraudulent mystique. I mean, 50 million for that? Make that Aaron Robbers. That's what he is, Aaron Robbers. Now Aaron Rodgers' offense has managed to score 22 total points and lose to New England, whose coach, of course, Gerard Mayo, the new coach, was blasted by the old coach last week. That's that guy Belichick. Blasted for publicly calling out his team, calling the Patriots soft. Belichick said, you just don't do that. Maybe Gerard Mayo has a better idea how to coach this team and motivate this team than Belichick did because, once more, in the three years Belichick coached this team after Brady left this team, was forced out the back door by this team, Bill Belichick managed to make it to one playoff game. It was at Buffalo. Belichick's team lost 47-17 to because Belichick's defense not one time could stop Josh Allen's offense. Not one time. They scored every time they touched the football. It was the perfect game on offense against a very overrated Belichickian defense. So now we have two towering NFL figures, often called GOAT, Aaron Rodgers, Bill Belichick, both of whom are getting exposed. And now I'm sorry to say in New York, Aaron Rodgers is turning into a one-man version of the Knicks. You just can't trust him anymore. Frankly, you haven't been able to trust him for about seven years now. You heard it here first. Speaking of Buffalo, my MVP right now, around we're somewhere in that halfway mark of the NFL season, my MVP right now is Josh Allen. Long, long way to go. But he has thrown 14 touchdown passes to only one interception. I'm giving him a very slight edge over Lamar. Maybe I'm prisoner of the moment from yesterday at Cleveland. Lamar is 17 touchdowns to only two interceptions. Josh was leading in QBR, leading the league for most of the year until yesterday. He did not have a great QBR. 
it was 48, just a little below average. But Buffalo had a great day, won impressively at Seattle. So now Josh has fallen to fourth in QBR. Lamar is second, but Baltimore is five and three to Buffalo six and two. So obviously Buffalo moved on from Stefan. And look at him now. So many injuries on the defensive side. And just look at him now. Josh Allen has grown up right before your very eyes. He is no longer that turnover machine who led the NFL in turnovers since he first stepped foot on an NFL field going into this year, led in turnovers. But now he's turned into one of the best post-game interviews in the game, one of the best leaders in pro football, and so far, my MVP. Quick sip of the Breakfast of Champions. So yesterday, I was so impressed with, and I felt so sorry for Baker Mayfield. No Mike Evans. Obviously, no more Chris Godwin. And Baker still threw for 330 yards. Three touchdowns, but yep, you got me two interceptions. Even though... They came at the hands of Jesse Bates, who might be the best safety in football for Atlanta, and A.J. Terrell, who's one of the best corners. Baker gambles. He tries to do too much, especially without Evans and Godwin. But now Baker's throwing to Kate Otten and Rakeem Jarrett and Bucky Irving, and it's just sad. It's just hard to watch. Tampa tried a fake punt down seven. It was just dumb. It had no chance of working. But Baker just kept battling and battling. He always battles. He'll always fight. He still leads the NFL with 21 touchdowns, but he does have nine interceptions. And the Bucs finally lost at home to their division rival, to Atlanta, to Kirk Cousins who had four touchdowns and zero picks. You probably know I've never believed in Kirk Cousins. I've never bought into Kirk Cousins. He'll always let you down when you least expect it and most need it. Kirk Cousins will. He's one and four in the postseason. Is Kirk Cousins, whose GM in Washington once called him Kurt Cousins derisively. Man, Dak owned Kirk Cousins when he was in Washington. Heck, the Cowboys owned Kirk Cousins when he was in Minnesota. Beat him twice. Andy Dalton and Cooper Rush, they both beat him up at Minnesota. Can you believe that? Cowboys have always been able to count on Kirk turning into Kirk Cousins, throwing it to them in every crucial situation right on schedule. Yet now the three and four Cowboys are two or two and a half point underdogs at five and three Atlanta. Yep. Kirk Cousins has Atlanta at five and three. He just seems different to me this year. I must admit it. He seems like he's growing up finally right before your very eyes. And it seems like he's 45. Does he ever have some serious weapons now around him? Whew, 14 touchdowns, seven interceptions. He's 11th in QBR. So I'm afraid that this time, Kirk Cousins of all scarecrows in the pocket, Kirk Cousins, the quarterback whose helmet's always looked like it's too big for his body, like he's just some little kid playing grown-up out there in the pocket. I'm just afraid Kirk Cousins is about to get some big revenge on Dak and Dallas this Sunday in Atlanta. And I end with my guy, LeBron James, who had an all-time great explosion to start Saturday night's fourth quarter. I was watching. I never miss a dribble of a LeBron game. 
Yet that was followed by an all-time ugly explosion on the bench during a timeout after he'd scored 16 early in that fourth quarter. With 8.01 left in the game, Rui Hachimura had taken and had missed a two-point jumper, and LeBron had immediately called timeout. Not J.J. Redick, LeBron coaches this team. Ultimately, LeBron called the timeout. And on the bench, LeBron had something to say to Rui. LeBron said to Rui, and please pardon my language, I'm only quoting, swing that motherfucker to me. I make 10 in a row, and you're going to take a pull-up contested two? Swing, swing, motherfucker. Now, to me, Rui is a pro's pro. He's in his seventh NBA season, always plays hard. I, I think he plays smart. He just doesn't deserve that kind of verbal abuse. He's often played big in big playoff games when LeBron has played small. See Denver in the conference finals two years ago when Rui averaged 15 a game. You can't ask for much more than that from your complimentary sort of small forward. Heck, he really plays power forward to me. Remember Denver two years ago? Four times going into the fourth quarters. Lakers were right there. They just needed the king to take over. They just needed the quote-unquote goat. That's all I've ever heard about LeBron. The goat to go goat on the Nuggets, who were on their way, of course, to winning that championship. LeBron? Where are you, LeBron? In those four fourth quarters combined, LeBron went 7 of 23. He went 1 of 10 from 3. And in the closeout game 4 at home, at what used to be Staples. LeBron had two shots to tie the game, two two two-point shots to tie. One hit the side of the backboard, and the other, as he drove it at the end of the game, he could not get up through the defense, especially of Jamal Murray, Aaron Brooks, and it did not touch the rim. He had two shots that did not reach the rim to tie the game. While Rui was averaging 15 points a game against Denver and playing very, very well. So, yeah, I know what all you blind witnesses are going to fire back at me. I know, I know, I know I was there. Michael Jordan often jumped all over his teammates to motivate them. But that was while they were going 6-0 and in the finals. That's while Michael was backing it up, then shutting up his teammates by telling them what they should be doing and lighting fires under teammates that worked because everybody rose and shone around Michael's magic, around his force field. He could lash out. He could be profane, but it was all in a very positive, let's go win the bleeping game kind of a vein. And trust me on this, Michael never really publicly pretended to be a nice guy. He was just one bad MF, and he didn't mind if you knew it. LeBron, he was just so demeaning and so disrespectful to a player who just doesn't deserve it. I mean, come on, was that just about stats or was that actually about winning the game? I I don't know, LeBron. So am I to think that you then pouted for the rest of the game? Because, LeBron, you didn't score a single point in the final 8-23 of that game. So let me get this straight. You scored 16 in about three minutes at the top of the fourth quarter. And then the final 823, you don't score. Not a single point, not even a free throw. It took a huge three that Anthony Davis had the guts to take and did make a huge late three. And then he had to make a huge late free throw 
to hold off a team that has been the Lakers' nemesis, the Sacramento Kings. The king went king for a while against the Kings. Then he disappeared. So I'm I'm wondering, did Rui, during that Denver series last year, or even, what about this year? Remember this, this past year's? It was the first round series against Denver that the Lakers got gentlemen swept in. Remember what happened? First game, LeBron was pouty in the fourth quarter, I guess because he'd taken so much crap through the offseason about coming up so small in the four fourth quarters of the conference finals against Denver. I don't know. He just wouldn't even shoot in the fourth quarter. Looked like he just shut down to me in the fourth quarter. And predictably, Lakers were close. Lakers lost. Then game two, remember what happened? LeBron wound up with a wide-open free throw of a three-point shot. It was like you're by yourself at the free throw line shooting a three to win the game. I think it wins the game. And he missed it, predictably. So did, did Rui ever call timeout against Denver two years ago or Denver this past playoffs and go over to LeBron on the bench and say, come on, score, motherfucker. Did he ever say that? No, I... I don't think he said that because nobody's going to say that to the king. LeBron coaches his team. He runs his franchise. Yet LeBron can be such a thin-skinned diva, such a hard-to-follow leader. Maybe that's why LeBron hasn't won a real championship since Ty Lu was his leader coach and since Kyrie provided his clutch gene in Game 7. Remember 2016? It's going on nine years ago. I'm sorry, LeBron. I am not giving you that Mickey Mouse bubble title during that pandemic. Come on, LeBron. Lead. That's it for this episode. Thanks to Tyler Korn for producing. Thanks to Ernestine for overseeing. And especially thanks to Hazel for approving.